Developing tomorrow's leaders. Educating, supporting, and inspiring the next generation of leaders. They need a village of supporters that can guide, direct, and lead them on the path to success. Your host, Antoine Thompson, or Coach T, has over 35 years of experience of empowering, motivating, and enhancing the lives of many young men and women. In this episode, Coach T talks with the founder of Steris, president and co-founder of Helpopedia, Laura Lynn Mears. Join Coach T and his village of inspiration. Welcome to another episode of Development Tomorrow's Leaders. I am your host, Antoine Thompson, or Coach T. And I'm delighted to welcome Laura Lynn Mears to the show. How are you doing today, Laura Lynn? I am well. Thank you, Antoine, for hosting me here. Oh, we're glad to have you. And, you know, you are part of the Changemaker series. And it's great to have you on here because you are a game changer and a change maker. And so I really want to talk to, first and foremost, you are the founder of Steris and also the co-founder of Helpopedia. And the first thing I'd love for you to do is share a little bit more about Steris because uh, it's quite interesting. And I think our listeners will really appreciate it. Okay, so terrific. So thanks for that. I guess before we even go in, the first thing is always start with a co-founder. So if you're out there, go <laughs> in 50-50 with somebody. That's mistake number one. Don't do it. <laughs> mistake number two and i'm diving into this before i get into what steers does and is don't be a c corporation oh my god all the extra paperwork and this and that is lunacy don't do it so what is steerus steerus came about because i saw that young people and even re-entering talent were really struggling with their communication skills and how to you know, kind of build friendships, relationships, professional networking. And I thought, wow, there's got to be a better way to be able to do this for people. So we started putting that together and thought, well, it's going to be accessible to people that have special needs and other challenges where they just can't get information readily. So let's design a platform that people can use that everybody thinks is a website because it's so easy to use. So that's what I did. And that's what Steer is. So we are an e-learning platform. I'm very proud to say award-winning, where we host content and services to help people with their talent development as they grow, find new skills like communication, time management, professionalism, and build those skills so they can find more success in the workplace. That's Dearest. That, that's awesome. It's great to have that all in one place so people don't have to bounce around the web trying to find this or that. It's almost like a one-stop shop, fair to say? Absolutely. That's that's exactly it. And funny, because that's going to sound very familiar with Helpopedia, which is really my vision for Steerus anyway, but in a nonprofit skin, where we centralize access to all that content and services and people like yourself that have amazing skills and content and services and make them available to a wide audience, free, yeah. discounted, or at the price if they can afford it, if they have the means. And see, that's the part I like is that, you know, a lot of times you go to a particular site or you go to a business and there's always a price tag associated with whatever content you receive. And and the great thing about Sears and Helpopedia platforms is that they offer services and information. You can get free information just to get a taste of what you think you need and you find out you need more, then you can go for the paid content. Well, that's right. And I made that commitment possible. So first of all, a lot of the coaches and other professionals in my network and my ecosystem of Steerus, they were very generous with their time and their support and believing in me. Like talk about, right, creating a community of change makers. They're like, yeah, I'm on board. I love this. And so they contributed their brilliance, their time, their content to help make that possible. And I did my part too. And I created this platform by mortgaging my house. There's mistake number three. Don't do it. Uh, use other people's money, right? OPO, OPM, OPM. I mean, yeah, yeah, other people's money. So, That's but right. here's a, here's another thing I'd love to ask you too, because it's such a big project. What really? What was the the focus and what was the the thought behind? Hey, how can I how can I make this happen? And how and why you wanted to make this happen? I just well, it all started South by Southwest four years ago. As a journalist in the audience, a uh, massive conference for those of you that haven't been. It's in Austin, Texas. It invades the city. People get displaced from their homes and everybody builds these temporary pop-up installations in people's homes downtown Austin. It's just, it's it's a thing. 
Uh, concerts are going 24 seven as bands are competing, startup pitch contests are going just about 24 seven, et cetera, et cetera. Net, net, fast forward. I was at the top 100 watching these 100 amazing entrepreneurs present their ideas. Just about fell out of my chair when I saw only one was over the age of 30. And I was like, Gah! and so that hurt a lot. And then I looked at the rest of them and the judges were famous people, household names, right, in tech. And they were giving advice to these wonderful young entrepreneurs who have such amazing futures ahead and saying, now, 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 Antoine, maybe I'd like you to have you think about A instead of B. No, no, I don't need it. Yeah, I got it. Nope, don't worry about it. I've done it all. I've got it all figured out. And I was, oh, my God, you don't know how to receive feedback. This is this is golden feedback. He's a gazillionaire and everybody knows his name. And you are, I don't even remember what his name was now or what his business was like all these years later. So obviously it didn't even stick in my head and they couldn't take feedback. And then the young gals, oh my goodness, crocodile tears. But strange, strange, strange. And, and I'm like, oh my God, it's feedback. It's okay to mess up. It really is okay. Not everybody's going to knock it out of the park. We're not all Mark Zuckerbergs. We're not all Bill Gates, right? Everybody has an ability to enjoy some level of success. We're on different trajectories and we're on different gradients. But we can all find success in some way that speaks to our strengths and our passions and our interests. And we don't and shouldn't compare ourselves to the Mark Zuckerbergs and Bill Gates because they are you know, one in a billion, one in two billion people, exceptional people. Right. I think that you hit a big point there in what young people strive for is they see something. I want to be that. And they forget who they are and what they want. And then they start chasing something that they may get. But will they be happy once they get it? Because they don't know, truly know who they are. And I think this is a another great opportunity, a great example of what Steers and Helpopedia helps guide people and direct them in where they fit best and help them realize where they will excel versus where they may struggle to succeed. That's right. So two things. One, study after study has shown that lottery winners, where we all think like, wow, they won a X billion or, you know, especially these lottos are so crazy in their size lately. They want X hundred million, this, that. Those winners are less happy than the average bear. So that's number one. So money isn't the only answer. And then number two, on trying to find out in which your path is and all of that, that comparison, it's so tempting to do, especially in social media, right? We're bombarded. Oh, look at her. Oh, my goodness. Her buccal fat's been removed. Her cheeks look fabulous. Wow, she's so skinny. Look at her waist. It's a size minus 10, right? And and this is this whole social media, oh my goodness, don't even get me started. It's a curated micro slice of people's lives that's not even real. Half the crap is filtered anyway, maybe even more. And then we compare ourselves to like the Mr. Beasts or Kardashians or this or that or all these household names. And how does that serve us? Use it to inspire you to know that anything's possible, but don't use it as your yardstick to judge yourself. That is good. The word inspiration, that's exactly how I view it. And when when talking with young people, it's like when you see somebody succeed at something, it's like, man, what they probably went through to achieve that. If I just put forth the same effort to achieve what I want versus what they have, I'm more likely not only to achieve it, but I'm gonna I'm gonna be a lot happier and a lot more content in my life. And to your point about lottery winners, we have all heard the horror stories of how quickly people, number one, go through money, how their lives are turned upside down. There's nothing, absolutely nothing that they are happy about once they win that money. That's right. And the thing is, I, I heard this at some point very early in the pandemic. Uh Eric Wan who is the CEO and founder of Zoom, right? We all know Zoom, right? We're Zooming now. Everybody right. Zooms. It became a verb, right? They went from, I don't know, I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but at the start of the pandemic, we'll call it 3 million users. And then within a month of the pandemic, they went up to 400 million users, right? All the stuff was in the cloud. It wasn't safe, like all kinds of stuff. And he was being interviewed 
on one of the major news stations. Again, I don't even remember. I watched so much of that, and I'm sure everybody did, glued to our TVs because we couldn't leave our houses and we were terrified. So we watched the news 24 7. And he was being interviewed, and they're like, Eric, what does it feel to be an overnight success? And he said, longest nine years of my life. There you and go. And that has stuck with me. Yeah. See, and it's all about perception, too. The perception is that this has always been a big a big thing. And then to find out nine years of hard work, highs, lows, successes, failures, but sticking to it. You know, resiliency. And here we are. And he's still racking up the dollars as we speak. <laughs> That's right. And it's, there's sacrifices, right? And you do them maybe even unwillingly. So like not everybody and even me, I can't even say like, oh, I do all these sacrifices willingly, but something inexplicable, which is my passion and commitment to wanting to drive change, like pulls me, even though like, I'm like, oh, oh, like 3.30 in the morning, I submitted a proposal. I'm like, I'm so bloody tired. But I want to do this. I want to succeed. I want to make a difference. I want to help people. So that pulls me forward. And that's what keeps me going. Even Lisa, when the sacrifices, it's another thing. It's all oh, bros and Lambos. Uh-uh. Like I'm pumping up the air in my tire because I don't <laughs> want to. And I can't afford to get all new tires and all the alignment right now. I duct tape my running shoes to make them last a little bit longer, right? Because I'm focused on putting the money into the software or the something else. And that's what it takes. Well, it also lets you know what's important to you. I mean, you gave a couple examples of day-to-day things that we all go through and, you know, hey, my tire's getting a little worn. Let me go get some. Well, you got a few thousand miles left on them. You know, you get the most out of something. So you're not so quick to jump to change and you're willing to stick through what what you really believe in, and you mentioned you know the word help in there in a minute uh, a second ago, and I really want to go ahead and shift to that because there's so many levels and components that are uh, associated with uh, the Helpopedia, and obviously I know a little, but I want you to share with our listeners and our viewers because it's also be on YouTube as well. But the seed planet for Helpopedia. And and as being a part of it, I'm seeing it grow really quickly. And there's a reason for that because see, people see the value in it. And I'd love for you to share a little bit more about that. Oh, there's lots of reasons. One of them, Phil Vitrano, another one, Antoine Thompson, right? Like I could go on and on. But if if I if I roll it back and say where this sort of all came from, like my dream is and has been no ask for help goes unheard. Right. It's one thing. Yeah, you can Google stuff and, you know, or even like, yeah, you can go on YouTube and go like, hey, this is how you can, I don't know, unstick your dishwasher, like whatever. Right. You can find on there, you know, how to make your tires last a little bit longer. Right. All this stuff. And that's that's great. But it's not enough because you're expected to do it all by yourself. And some problems, human problems are complex. And just watching a YouTube video isn't going to get it done. You need another human to nudge you along and to help you. And the impetus behind, I believe, Helpopedia's success, not only the key individuals, right? Like yourself, Keith Senzer and Sullivan, uh, Christine Murnott, like there's so many people, Bill Walters, like just amazing folks. But the collective ethos of the group is that everyone is a social entrepreneur. Everyone is committed to making a change and everyone is okay with making some money for their craft because they are giving of their time and of their talent, but they want to help. So they put it in. And by having this quote unquote value-based group of social entrepreneurs who want to make a genuine difference in their communities and in so doing rise with it and rise with everyone, that's the fuel. My platform is just the platform kind of connecting all the dots. I mean, you know, okay, maybe that's selling it a bit short, but, you know, it's useful. Um, And, you know, doing the stuff I do and all the back end, that's certainly useful, making Helpopedia real, but it's the people that are the fuel. That's the difference. I couldn't capture that with Steerus, but with Helpopedia is really a very much a nonprofit version. People are better aligned to the mission and that's what they want to do because by helping each other, 
they can also get the help and find success. And then who doesn't like to be rewarded for doing good? No one goes into it. Well, I shouldn't say no one. People mostly don't go into it expecting a linear exchange that if I give this, then I want this back, right? That's that's not the way to look at it. But they're feeling it by them giving something and they see it. It's like, it's just, it's magic. It's fuel. People are the fuel. No, 100%. You mentioned a couple of names in there. And I, I want to share with our listeners how all this ties and how it's so powerful. I have a group that's called the Village of Inspiration. And one of the reasons that I was uh, brought into Helpopedia is because Phil, um, Keith introduced me to Phil. And Keith happens to be a member of the Village of Inspiration. <laughs> But also Ann Sullivan is also a member of the Village of Inspiration. And what you described Helpopedia as being is what the Village of Inspiration is. So it is truly uh, bringing the best of people in under one umbrella, all serving the same purpose, giving of themselves with one goal in mind. And that's no um, request going unfulfilled, ultimately, is what it comes down to. So that's why I'm really proud to be a part of it, because I know... Those two being a part of it, I when they mentioned it to me, I knew that it was some, a lot of value to it, and they knew what I do would bring some value. And of course, after meeting you and, and hearing more about it, and Phil is a phenomenal organization that uh, has so much potential, and I look forward to the journey along with you and the others. It And it's amazing to have like your support and the support of everybody so early. Like I said, it's just uh, I, I'm I'm humbled by it in one side, and then the other side, I'm not surprised by it. I because people do want to do good. People recognize that the world is hurting, and it's a tough world out there. And if we help each other, wow, right? Even if you can make it a little better, a little less painful, a little bit brighter, that's a good thing. That's a great people thing. People want that. They crave that. Yeah. Well, but I also want to give you credit too, because you know what you created and what you and Phil created with Helpopedia is something that a lot of us were have all thought about. How do we do something like? That? How do we meet uh, reach the masses? You know, we're just one person or two people or three people, but you turn two, three people into 20, 30, 40, 50 people in one place. It's like, hey, you know, I have everything that I need and everything that I want and all at the at my fingertips, literally, you know, either phone, computer, whatever it might be. So I think what you've started is phenomenal. And like I said, it's going to be great. So I'd love to touch on one specific thing that stood out to me when I first started and was looking at your serious website and all of the things you do. There's one word that stuck out to me, stuck out to me, and it's something that I strive for with all the kids I work with. And that's the word leadership mm. because everything that we're all, what we're talking about is encompasses leadership, every aspect of it. You're talking about people trying to reinvent themselves, getting back in the workplace, younger people getting into the workplace and trying to find or getting all the tools that they need. And it all ties back to leadership. So I'd say that to ask you this question, was that a big part of it? Because it just seems like it's when I go through it, it just seems like everything I read, that word just keeps coming back to me. It absolutely is because leadership, I think, has a broad definition in the sense that you even need to lead yourself, right? Like you can't rely on everybody else to take you down the path because you can't ever be 100% sure that the path they're taking you on is the right path or even the right path for you. You have to take the time and pause and think about that. So you need to lead yourself, right? Is this in alignment with my values and what I want? Is this in alignment with the direction I see my life going? Are these the things I like to spend my time doing or thinking about? That's leadership and you're trying to step up. And then I also think that along the way, the whole pandemic has really turned things upside down, people working remotely and all the rest of this, even though I've been in, you know, secretly in my fuzzy slippers and my jammies since 1998, because I've been on this bandwagon for a long time, but now the secret's out, so it's not so fun anymore. But anyway, but the, um, but, you know, with this, that people have, I think, conflated managing with leading. 
And what that means in plain speak is that managing people is like, yep, I got to check the box. Did Antoine get his paycheck? Yep, he did. Did Antoine turn in his TPS report this week? Yes, he did. Did Antoine send me that email or make that contact? You said, yep, he did, right? That's managing people. Leading people takes everyone up to that higher plane where you say, and again, you, you want everybody vibrating at this level of energy, right? And you want you as the leader, if you're doing it right, get fueled by the energy you're creating because you're putting it in and putting it into everybody around you. And then it magnifies, right? Like one spark can cause an explosion, right? In the very best kind of way. One one spark can cause a forest fire, right? And again, we'll think about it in a more positive sense because that's kind of a negative example, but that that energy, that heat comes back in and fuels you up to go and rise and do greater things. Because when your team is stepping up and everybody's there, it's like, yeah, Laurelyn, that TPS report, I got it. You've got me motivated. I'm totally dialed in next. Hey, oh, that other group, that conference, I'm on it. Let me get that set up. You go do that. You go do your swim lane stuff that you're really good at. And trust me, I got this. I'm in my swim lane. I got it. And that's leadership. When you start filling in your gaps of what you can't do and enabling the people around you to just freaking knock that gap out of the park and give them every bit that they need so that they shoot off into the stratosphere and do really well. Because if they do well, you do well. I thought I was the motivator coach. That was a great speech right there. I like that. I'm ready to go out and play now, coach. Uh, I'll take you on. (laughs) That's the, uh, (laughs) hey, Oh, hey, no, I don't, I, and I'll hang up my shoes. I hung up my shoes a couple of years ago. <laughs> I appreciate this. Just had a over gym yesterday. One of the kids wanted to challenge me to one-on-one. He's 14 and I'm 58. I'm like, yeah, that ain't happening. <laughs> no. You can't have unfair advantages, right? And all these no. kids now, they've got vitamins in their toothpaste. Like, yeah, I'm 6'8 and I'm 12. Yeah. yeah. And I, no, yeah. no, 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 that's not going to work. But I love that because you just described empowerment to, to its highest level. And I think that's how you get the most out of people is, number one, you empower them by your example. But the other thing is they know that their opinion and input is valued. And I think that that is where leadership starts, is when you let people around you know that their opinions and, and um, values matter. Absolutely. And then as the leader, any level, even as the kid in the playground, hey, if you're out there listening you know, or the kid on the court, you can set a vision. The vision doesn't have to be super grand. Like mine's a bit crazy, right? No ask for help, you know, ever goes unheard, right? That's fairly, fairly large and involved. And we need a few billion dollars. Mackenzie Scott, Melinda (laughs) French, if you're listening, right? Um, and, And then, you know, just a massive community of people. So it doesn't have to be that grand. But you create something and that's what draws people into you. And they're like, oh my God, I love how you think. I love what you're thinking. I love that you're putting the energy and intentionality into achieving that thing. Can can I join you in some way and help you achieve that thing? Because that thing sounds a lot like the things that matter to me, right? And that's how you start building. And then that's ultimately whether you are deliberate about it, or you kind of fall into it, you become that leader and people come into your ecosystem. And if you do things right, everybody does the magic they do. And then collectively, right, you get glitter and sparkles everywhere and stuff happens. You remind me a lot of myself because when you said no ass goes unheard, when you decided to go with that, you knew that would challenge you to fulfill as many asks as you could, as opposed to limiting yourself. Uh, it reminds me of uh, years ago when I started my nonprofit and I was asked by a former uh, North Carolina basketball player. He goes, well, who's your target audience? I said, any kid that needs my help. And he told me, he goes, no, you can't be all things to everybody. And when I left the meeting, I was like, yeah, he's right. And I'm like, well, no, 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 you don't know me. You don't know that when I say any child that I can help, 5, 6, 17, 18, 22, if I can help, I help. So even though you have experience, it always means you have the knowledge. Experience is one thing. Knowledge is another because it's about what you retain 
they always they talk about the best coaches are not always the best players. Uh, Dean Smith is the first one I think of is at University of North Carolina for 36 years, played on a national championship in 1957 as it came off the bench, barely played. But he's one of the winningest coaches in all of basketball, one of the most re uh, respected coaches in all of basketball. My coaching style emulates his because he always teaches life before basketball. So that's what I've kind of learned. And that's what I, I hear coming from you is that you're that same type of person. Oh, for sure. And then, you know, again, just since I've been fessing up all of the, you know, startup mistakes since, you know, we started our, our call here and podcast today, that it's also where you have to know that there are capacity limiting issues, right? That are very, very real. You have a finite amount of time. I'm not a trust fund baby. So I have a finite amount of money, right? And I dug into a hole to get the money I have. And that's, that's good that I had the ability to do that, but it's, you know, still a hole, right? It's not the pile of money where I can just keep going into the, you know, the money tree and going, great, here's a few more thousand, woohoo, right? That's not there. And so, your other former mentor is totally right about who do you want to focus on? And that has been one of my challenges. I want to help everybody. And it's very hard for me to dial it in. And yeah. as like ADHD and oh, I like this and I, you know, my business coach is like, Laura Lynn, you like shiny, don't you? I'm like, yes, bright, shiny new objects, bring them in, right? I like everything that glitters and sparkles, bring it, bring it. But bringing that level of focus, like I said, that has, my my mentor knows me best. He's been my boss three times in, I don't know, 20 some years. And he like, he gets it. He's like, LL, like, I know, I know. Dennis, if you're listening, um, focus. And it's hard because when your heart is bigger than your resource bucket, it makes it very challenging. And you're in the same boat, Antoine, with all yeah. the wonderful things yeah. that you do. And sometimes we need those external forces to say, you know what, this is the best path forward right now. Oxygen mask theory, right? Get some oxygen. Laurelyn, you've been sick for freaking months. Take some oxygen, get strong, and then come back and look out, right? Yes. Get refueled. Absolutely. Yeah. So one of the things I definitely want you to share, because I'm hoping that we have some educators and some uh, school administrators listening to this as well, um, a couple of things that Helpopedia does, one in particular, you mentioned earlier about RFPs. If you could share a little bit about that process and what Helpopedia is going to be and what you're doing with that and how Helpopedia is going to benefit from that as well as school systems and students and teachers as well. Oh, for sure. Okay. First, let, let me like roll it back. Uh, I'm a very strong communicator, oral and written. I've built those skills up over time. So that's something that you definitely need. You need to be able to package your ideas and present them in written form and, you know, own your square, right? Present them in oral form so that you can bring people into your vision and take you along. All right. That said, over time, I've had a lot of experience in different jobs responding to RFPs, which are essentially sales solicitations. Those typically come from, so an RFP stands for request for proposal. So usually some city of X town or a county of X, you know, or state of X or agency department of insert, whatever the agency is, food, housing, whatever it is, says, Hey, we, you know, we have this thing that we need. We need people to help educate. For example, a school board might come out, educate our students on helping them transition from high school into the next step. Might be college, might be vocational school, no, it might be work right? Might be a year off just to people for people to reset, get strong and get ready, whatever that is. And so these proposals come out and they invite vendors like Steer Us, like Helpopedia to say, what you got? Tell me what you got and how much it's going to cost and tell me why you're fabulous and why we should contract with you versus the other 100 vendors that submitted. That's a request for proposal. And just while I'm here, there's also an RFQ which is a request for quote. That's like, yeah, you know what? We don't have time for all that other stuff and fancy covers and this and that and the explanation. Just give us a freaking number, right? If you're the lowest bidder, done, you got the deal. Call it done. And you already have a reputation? Cool. Yeah, we'll hire you. We're, we're confident. Then there's an RFI, 
which is a request for information. That's kind of the early step. It's kind of like the pre-meeting, right? You know, everybody meets before the meeting to talk about what you're going to meet about. And that's the RFI, request for information, where city of, county of, X, whatever, school board of X says, yeah, we're about maybe sort of kind of possibly entertaining the idea of doing X and we're just going to float it out there and see if any spaghetti sticks on the wall that people might sort of maybe kind of want to possibly invest their time and hundreds and thousands of dollars to write a response to tell us what we should probably kind of maybe know if we do maybe possibly consider going to market with an RFP, Right. And so there's a lot of preamble there and RFIs are time consuming and it doesn't necessarily guarantee that just because you submit a response that they're going to call you back and say, now we put the proposal out. Now now let's see, let's see the numbers, right? Let's see the real deal. Show me the, show me the juice, right? Uh, So RFIs aren't always worth the squeeze. And I write a lot of them and I'm doing them for the members of Helpopedia. They benefit because members will run it like a co-op that if you are contributing your time and your efforts and you're helping grow Helpopedia and you have service ABC that's needed by this RFP, then we go and we present the collective and say, here's here's how we are, because none of us can do everything on our own, right? We're all good, but we're not that good. And But as a team, oh, 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 now you've got the world's leading X and the state's leading Y and the, you know, whatever, this and that. And, you put all that together and you're like, yeah, try and beat us. Go ahead. Just try. I dare you. Right. We're going to win because we have an amazing, amazing group of members who individually are highly accomplished. And as a group, we're going to be hard to beat one day, maybe not yet, but one day. Oh, we're on the way. We're on that way. So the RFIs are, are new to me. I was not aware of those. And so here's my question to you about those. Are they always, you said that they're not always a guarantee. Do you spend a lot of time on those? Or you just kind of look through and say, yeah, I might do that. Can you tell when you get them if they're worth you doing? Or it's just a, like a, a crapshoot? Well, like I said, like I generally don't think they're worth the squeeze. But I always sniff and go, huh, so-and-so agency is looking at an e-learning platform, college career transition services, communication, interpersonal relationship training. That's the stuff we do. I'm going to watch you, right? It's like, just like they're trying to reach out and fish and see who they should be watching. If you are a trend spotter and a strategic thinker and planner, you're like, I see you agency. I'm watching you now, right? What are you doing? And so it can be, it's a very informative sort of, I guess, like a learning point and launching point, but I don't always take it all the way through because they are time consuming and you want to produce something of quality. And so I really, I do, I do look at them, but not always respond to them. Yeah. Well, the reason I, I like this, this aspect is when I was first hearing about it, when I first started just kind of getting some information about Helpopedia, the one thing that stood out to me because from what several of us do in the group, or I think a lot of us do, but I know uh, some in particular, the services we provide are what schools are so desperately needing. And you know that as well as I do, you know, when we talk about the, the personal growth and development skills that kids aren't having, there's so many different angles in which to pr- provide that for them. And I think that's one of the, to me, it's one of the biggest strengths that Helpopedia provides. Well, and that's just it. So we're out there and if, hey, principals, superintendents we're looking for fellow visionaries we understand that the curriculum is limited right the board of education is very prescriptive thou shalt do thou shalt teach this grade four thou shalt teach this grade nine right it's very very prescriptive not a lot of wiggle room there teachers are completely maxed out and what they got to do and like, in my spare time yeah i'll teach them this extra stuff sure I'll keep the kids home from lunch and after school for a couple of hours. And yeah, we'll all, you know, we'll all get it done. Not happening. But these superintendents, these teachers, anyone out there, parents who are going, wait a minute, my child or my student is not being maximally prepared for success. 
because we've gone so far down the rabbit hole. <gasps> oh my God, their math isn't good. We need common core. Oh my God, we need more of this. That we've lost the big picture, which is teaching people how to learn. And that's what PhD does. It's like, that's what my PhD, it doesn't mean piled high and deep that people make jokes. Thank you very much. That's not what it means. What it means is I spent a lot of years learning how to learn, how to learn independently, how to find information, how to interpret information, how to collate information, how to analyze information, how to find how to connect all of the dots so I can find a path through the information that says all of this collectively means this. That's teaching people how to learn. And then once you learn that, you learn how to learn, you can take on anything. You want to improve your digital presence? Great. Watch some courses. Watch some people who have mastery in it. Joel Osteen, Sunday mornings. I love his opening. It's fantastic. That man is one of the most charismatic, amazing public speakers. He starts with his little joke, right? Makes a little God joke. He goes in, goes in slowly, pauses and then goes in, right? Nails it every time. And watch people. And so once you've learned how to learn, you can learn from other people. And then you start getting your skills to a level where, well, maybe other people are going to start learning from me now. And the teachers and superintendents and people out there that recognize their kids aren't getting that, this is a call to action to you all. Step forward and recognize that there are accessible affordable, rapid solutions at your fingertips. Helpopedia. You can get so much. The Steerus Success Academy. We're award-winning in multiple states because we're doing cool stuff, teaching people how to learn and learn quickly and learn effectively. So the stuff's out there. You don't have to go it alone. Nobody. Well, it sounds like to me you're challenging them to be change makers within their yes. school systems. It's absolutely correct because you're not alone. You're a change maker. You recognize the need for change. That already puts you in the in the in the category of being a change maker. But that doesn't mean you have to carry the weight of the chain all yourself. That's why we're here. Every member that comes on is one more link in the chain, and it's not a link in the chain that's dragging us down. It's a link in the chain that says, "Yeah, we can just grow and grow and grow and grow and wrap our arms." around a bigger and bigger audience to help. That's what the chain is. That's the power. It's a magic chain. Oh, I love the, ma oh, the magic chain. Yeah. No weak links, only strong links. The links Bingo. get stronger with every person. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. I get it. It's magic. Well, Lorlan, this has been great. I, I tell you, it's I, I, although I knew a lot of it, hearing it again is, is really inspiring and, is, and it really helps motivate you to know that what you do matters and to be a part of something that is going to change lives is amazing. Actually, as uh, my dad used to say, it's outstanding and to be a part of it is great. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, before I we get to your how to contact you, I want to share, ask you one question I ask all of my guests. And that is, if you can name the person or persons that has inspired you or influenced you, who would that person or those individuals be? The list is long, but I, I won't take up all of your listeners' ear time. As long as you need. First, grade four. Mrs. Muldoon, I was the shy little girl. I was afraid to speak up. I, hard to imagine, right? I was the wallflower. The People are like, what? No, Lorlin, Lorlin, no lie. I'm like, no super shy little girl, like just terrified of speaking up. She put me in front of the room and she punched me in the stun. She was the short little, like, again, this would not go over well now, but back in Catholic school, back in that day, when I grew up back when dinosaurs were still there and we didn't have social media and cell phones and things like that. Right. It was okay to punch a kid. And so <laughs> punched me and she's like, speak up, let people know that you have things to say, let people know what's on your mind. You have great thoughts, great ideas, share them. And I was like, she, she got me going on that path. And then in high school, my biology teacher, Miss Pegarero, Ms. Pegarero was the first Ms. I'd ever encountered. I was like, ha, 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 this is, this is interesting. She was the first Steminist 
I knew. So she didn't call herself that, but looking back, that's really what she was. And that inspired me. And I thought, ha, 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 this is interesting. She's the only chicky poo poo in a high school that is extreme, like math and science, lots and lots of male energy, no chicky poo poos. And she was, she suffered no fools and no nonsense, right? She was like, boom, boom. And that was fantastic. Uh, of course, my dad, he has always been, so my dad's a girl dad. He's got three girls and he was always like two things. Squeaky wheel gets the oil, always says that. And he said, just because you're a girl doesn't mean you can't do it or shouldn't do it, right? Like go do. I thought, wow, that's really powerful. And Dennis, who's been my mentor for 20 some years, like as I said, he's just, he's been my boss for so long. Uh, he gets me and he's always taking me off the ledge and bringing me back. And the last person, Dr. Bill Friend, who is now deceased, and I'm so happy that I saw him just a couple of months before he died and all this craziness of COVID and all this. He was living in Vancouver, so it wasn't easy to get to from New York, but uh, he was my master's professor. And I killed his life's work of research, his whole body of work because I wasn't able to keep the mosquito colony alive and going. So in the end, I had two sisters, like two female mosquitoes, who I swear had been mated by their cousins. So total genetic inbreeding depression. I had strapped them on in a little container to my side to keep them all warm and keep them happy so that they'd draw blood so they'd make eggs. And they died. I'm like, Bill, it's over. And he's like, you know what, Laurel? It's time to retire for me anyway. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the reason. <laughs> like, oh my God. So those are the people that, and there's so many more, but they they are the the big, big standouts. Like I said, there's no right or wrong answer. I, I think it's important for our listeners to know that there are different people in your lives that inspire you or influence you, and they come from different phases in your life. And you just gave a perfect example from fourth grade all the way through. Some people have just one person and whoever it might be. And that's a great example. You learn so many different things from each one of those, and you're still remembering those today. And tell those people. Tell them. Teachers want to hear that. They do selfless work every day. They're getting the next generation up and going, right? And, you know, Muldoon died before I could tell her, but Peggy Arrow sent her one of my books. I'm like, my God, you're a hero. Had no idea, right? And Mitch Goldblum wrote that amazing book, A Reason, A Season, A Lifetime. Everyone you meet fits into one of those three categories. No meeting is wasted and useless. So look at that with every meeting you have. Are you a reason? Are you a season? Short time? Or are you a lifetime? Yeah, uh, I can say, like you probably know as well as I do, everybody in your lifetime has this many friends or fewer real friends. And, you know, uh, those lifetimes, you know, I know mine are less than that. But, you know, when I really break them down, they're the right ones. Because you know, you know why they're there and you know they're always going to be there. And then we're talking about non-family members that we're referring to, of course. But you know, great, great, great feedback. I appreciate you sharing that. I think that's really inspirational. And yes, I'm surprised about the fourth grade thing. You shy, please. I'm not buying it. <laughs> right. If I could find some little pictures, I like the little hiding behind my bangs. Like, please, please don't ask me a question. Yeah. I don't know anything about banks. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, yeah, that might be a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, a few is right. Uh, so, Laurel, if you wouldn't mind sharing with our listeners uh, how they can get in contact with you, because I know they will want to. If they don't, they're in trouble. Okay, well, thank you for that. So, I live on LinkedIn. You can find me, Laurel and Mears. That's L O R A L Y N. It's spelled a little weird, but I kind of like being unusual. So, that's kind of a good thing. And you can also go to steer.us.us. So S T E E R.us. Come on into the Success Academy. You'll see Antoine, you'll see Keith, you'll see Anne, you'll see all kinds of really awesome people who just want to help you. So come on in there and you can email me, although don't expect an immediate response. Uh, that's Laurelin at steerus.io. And what other ways can you reach me? Well, just 
reach out. I'm I'm yeah. I'm out there. I'm I'm on the internet. Come find me. You can always reach out to me and I'll get you in contact with if you don't remember. Yeah, we can do that too. Oh, I know it's one other thing. We have a new member of Helpopedia who just uh joined recently that's also a member of my village of inspiration, and that's Anne Delane Clark. Oh, she excellent. just recently joined. Yes. So she's in with Christine's group. Um, so the wellness group. Yeah. So I wanted to, sh- I, I know you probably knew that, but uh, I, I neglect to mention her. I didn't want to leave her out because Bill of Inspiration is really important to us. But Laura Lynn, as always, I really appreciate it. Of course, we'll be in touch. We'll be seeing each other a lot and really th- appreciate your time, your knowledge, expertise, and your passion for what you're doing. And thank you, Antoine, for giving the gift that you do to youth, to each other, to help a Pete, to all of it. Like we are going to make magic happen. We are just getting started. We are going to make things happen. It's growing. It's going to happen. Laurel and Mears, I'm Coach T. And as always, I'm here to educate, support, and inspire the next generation of leaders. Till next episode, take care. Get your copy of Coach T's Sea of Success Guide to Preteen and Teen Success on his website, CoachT'sCorner.com.